yes. And, and wow, I'm loud, Lord, so I'm going to take it down a notch. God, I pray that you would just be with those in Port Austin, um, and not just in Port Austin. God, we know that it was uh, a rough night with storms throughout our state and beyond, and God, we just pray that you would be with those who have been affected by the storms, the tornadoes, the damage, God, just the concerns that that raises in people's minds, all of it, Lord, just help bring people out to meet the needs of those in communities that have been affected by the storms. And God, we do pray for those in Florida waiting and wondering and hoping for family to be uh, rescued and recovered. God, have mercy on that situation. Pray, God, that you would just move in power, and we just ask for grace on that uh, very hard and tragic situation. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you would, um, as my mic kind of gets tweaked here by my man, Billy, would you stand with me and let's just uh, do the Lord's Prayer together. Would, would you do that with me? Let's uh, pray the Lord's Prayer together. <clears throat> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And you can stay standing, and we'll have Amber take us into a time of worship together.
please be seated. Thanks, babe. All right. Well, here we are, finishing up Mark. It's been a while. We've been, we've been uh, working our way through the Gospel of Mark for a number of weeks, and we will be finishing today. So Mark 16, we're going to wrap things up. And basically, as I take us there in just a second... Um, Billy will get it up here on the screen. There's a few things I want you guys to remember. As you may recall, we looked at a section of Mark 16 way back at Easter Sunday. You remember that? Easter Sunday, we looked at Mark 16, 1 through 8, and we actually jumped out of our chapter order in our study for both Easter and, of course, the prior Sunday for Palm Sunday. Other than that, we've been working our way through Mark's gospel chapter by chapter. And of course, since Mark's objective all along was to present the truths about who Jesus was and is so that his listeners, his readers would trust in Jesus, it is very fitting that we end our time this morning talking about the reality of the resurrection So this morning, as we finish up Mark 16 and this portrait of Jesus that Mark has, uh, of course, painted for his audience and his um, readers down the road, we want to reflect on the reality of Jesus' physical resurrection. So Paul, Paul the Apostle, who had a dramatic conversion experience, as many of you know, stated this about Jesus' resurrection. Jesus uh, says here, Paul, in uh, 1 Corinthians about Jesus' resurrection. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I have preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Paul goes on in verses 12 through 15, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit in chapter 15, says, but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? So there were some people obviously saying, hey, there is no uh, rising of the dead, and Paul says, wait a minute, if that's the case, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. Paul goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 15... These verses, 16 through 20, I wanted to focus on. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you're still in your sins. Because that's why Christ died, right? Christ died for the sins of the world. But of course, what validated Christ's work on the cross in so many ways was the resurrection of Jesus' body. Then verse 18, and those also... Who have fallen asleep, those who have already passed in Christ, are also lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied, Paul says. And then you see I highlighted verse 20, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, those who have passed. Paul says, listen, we can trust that we will one day rise from the dead. Because Jesus is the very first one to have done that. Jesus was physically raised from the dead. How important is the empty tomb to our faith? I mean, when we think about it, it's probably something that you can't really overstate, right? The importance of Jesus' physical resurrection to the Christian faith is paramount. Sean McDowell, how many of you guys have heard of Josh McDowell? He was an apologist 
for, for many, many years, great apologist. Uh, his son, Sean, followed in his footsteps and actually uh, received his Ph.D. from Southern Baptist Theological Seminary and teaches at Biola. And Sean McDowell says this, The historical fact of the resurrection is the very foundation for the Christian faith. It is not an optional article of faith. It is the faith. The resurrection of Jesus Christ and Christianity stand or fall together. One cannot be true without the other. Belief in the truth of Christianity is not merely faith in faith, ours or someone else's, but rather faith in the risen Christ of history. My man, Craig Blumberg, you guys know I like Craig Blumberg, professor of uh, New Testament at Denver Seminary. My man Blumberg says this, the resurrection vindicates the claim that Jesus is both the Messiah and Lord. Everything Jesus taught, everything Jesus did, it didn't tell us for sure, right, when he died on a cross. No, everything he taught, everything he did was validated when he rose from the dead. This was God's Messiah. This was God in the flesh. The resurrection, like I said, is paramount. Now, this morning, where are we headed? So this morning, here's where we're headed. I want to review five claims that people have made, and that still seem to pop up from time to time to explain how the theory of Jesus' resurrection came about. Meaning, these are claims that deny a physical or bodily resurrection of Jesus. And then after this, we're going to look at five very powerful arguments that support an actual physical, historical resurrection of Jesus. So five theories that say Jesus didn't really rise from the dead, but this is what happened. And then we're going to look at five powerful arguments Points or arguments that point to the validity of a bodily historical resurrection of Jesus. So here's where we're headed. So let me take you to our little slide. So here's here is five rationalistic explanations of the resurrection. Maybe some of you've heard all of these. So we're just going to walk through these and kind of talk about them. The swoon theory. Another theory is that the disciples stole and hid Jesus' body. Another theory is Jesus' followers went to the wrong tomb. Another theory is eyewitnesses of the resurrection were hallucinating. And then lastly, it's kind of five part A, part B. Jesus' resurrection just became legendary over time. Or something mysterious happened. Something happened that was something like a resurrection, but we're just not going to call it that. Okay, so those are the five that we're going to look at here briefly. So let's talk about the swoon theory. Swoon, just sounds kind of funny to say, the swoon theory. So the swoon theory is the idea that, so the word swoon we don't use very much, so it speaks of when you faint, right? You're just so emotionally or physically uh, distraught or overcome that you actually faint. So, the idea is that Jesus fainted on the cross. They assumed he was dead. They took the body down, put him in a tomb. And then later, Jesus came to, found his disciples, albeit he was bloody and battered and bruised, and convinced them to go tell the world that he rose from the dead. Now, when we think about this theory, and I'm not going to be making fun of any theory this morning, but when we think about it, it's quite of a stretch, isn't it? It's quite a stretch to think that Jesus survived this execution known as crucifixion. You all, who here likes memes? Anybody like memes? I got a meme for you. And if you like Lord of the Rings, you'll like my meme even more. One does not simply swoon during a full Roman crucifixion. All right. If you're a Lord of the Rings fan, you know what this is actually from, but they've made it into a meme. You don't just swoon or faint during a Roman execution. Think about the sheer power and executional skill the Roman Empire had. I mean, think about it. People didn't just 
survive Roman executions. People didn't faint. People weren't confused or assumed to be dead and then go down off the cross and then later be like, oh, that guy survived that Roman execution. It didn't happen. On top of this, it's kind of hard to believe that if this did happen, somehow, that this bloody, battered, weakened, very injured Jesus convinced his closest followers to go tell the world that he rose from the dead. Doesn't seem very logical. What about the stolen body theory? Where's my kids? Hey, Jude, Charlotte, Isaac, you guys watching? I did this little one for you. Look at this little guy. Little robber guy. All right. You guys paying attention back there? Good. All right. So here we go. So what if they stole the body? Maybe that's what happened. This is kind of an intriguing one. Certain very, um, you know, devoted or devout followers of Jesus said, let's steal the body, we'll hide it, and then we'll convince the world that he really did rise from the dead. You know, Blumberg, my man, notes that this is attractive, but you know what? The problem is those followers who knowingly believed a lie were many then who later believed it to the point of their own death. So if these very radical followers of Jesus stole the body and hid it and then convinced the world that he really did rise from the dead, many of Jesus' radical closest followers were killed themselves. And psychologically speaking, that's hard to really think that that happened, that so many people would die for a lie when the, you know, when the rubber met the road, right? And let's think about this. We know from Scripture, there's people like Thomas that said, wait a minute, I'm a close follower of Jesus. Unless I see him physically and touch his scars, I ain't believing it. So there were people already thinking like that in Jesus' closest circle. So even if some of them had stole the body, some of them would have been like, then let me see the resurrected Jesus, because I ain't believing it otherwise. So there's your kind of uh, rebuttal, excuse me, to that one. Um, Wrong tomb, wrong tomb. Here's one for you. The wrong way. I know what happened. Those people went to the wrong tomb. The women, Jesus' closest followers, they went to the wrong tomb. Why this doesn't make much sense when we think about it is very quickly Christianity's opponents would have gladly pointed out the right tomb with Jesus' dead body right there, right? If they had gone to the wrong tomb, very quickly they said, well, wait a minute, you all went this way. Jesus was laid over here, and here he is still in the tomb. Dead, not risen. So what about hallucination? Hallucination. This is the theory that states everyone who saw the risen Jesus was actually hallucinating. Let me take you to 1 Corinthians again, 15, 1 through 7. Now, brothers and sisters, we looked at this a few minutes ago. This is Paul. I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and then he appeared to Cephas, to Peter, and then the twelve. And after that, I highlighted this for you guys, he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have passed away or fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and of course Paul goes on to say he appeared to me. What Paul is saying, there's a couple of things. When this was written, it was probably historically written around A.D. 55. We're talking at the most 25 years after Jesus' death. So 25 years from Jesus' death, Paul penned 1 Corinthians. But here's something even more significant. In fact, many historians believe that Paul is referencing here a very early creed of the Christian church. And so many scholars believe this is one of the best pieces of evidence 
for a physical resurrection of Jesus because Paul is writing something here that's already been something that they've been sharing and saying orally in the church for many, many years, putting the time span between Jesus' resurrection and when people started saying these creeds or this creed here, these beliefs, I should say, very short. But even if we say this is the first time it was stated, 25 years, Paul is making it very clear. Listen, there are people still alive that knew Jesus before he died and saw him rose from the dead. So go talk to him. I mean, we could easily do that today. 25 years isn't that long of a period of time. And Paul is actually encouraging people, as Sean McDowell says, to go talk to these people. If you don't believe me, go talk to them. So we see that built into here. But back to my point about hallucinations, there has never been an hallucination that has happened where it has occurred over numerous days with hundreds of people. That's just not how a hallucination works. So hallucinations don't happen over numerous periods of, of, uh, of weeks or days at a time, and it doesn't happen to groups of people like this from hundreds of people. So that just doesn't hold up. In fact, I got a little picture for you. Anybody familiar with this painting by Caravaggio, an Italian artist? It's called The Incredulity of St. Thomas. So there's St. Thomas, Caravaggio's uh, depiction of St. Thomas push, putting his finger in Jesus' side. You don't get hallucinations like that. It's the real deal, right? All right, so we come to what about it being a legend, part 5A. It's just legendary that the resurrection story just grew and grew and became a legendary tale. The problem with that is it doesn't jive with the historical evidence that we all have. Historically, that doesn't jive. Like, the legend doesn't work with everything we've just discussed and what we're about ready to discuss when we look at the five powerful arguments for a physical historical resurrection of Jesus. So then even scholars who are not Christians, who are, would be on the, on the more uh, liberal end of their studies, would say, yeah, the legend 5A, as I'm calling it, doesn't really work, so we're going to go with some phenomenon happened. In fact, I got a quote for you by one of those scholars. Let me take you to her. Her name is Paula Fredrickson. This is what Paula says. I know in their own terms what they saw, speaking of Jesus' followers, was the raised Jesus. Track her quote here. That's what they say, and then all the historic evidence we have afterwards attests to their conviction that that's what they saw. She goes on to say, I'm not saying that they really did see the raised Jesus. I wasn't there. I don't know what they saw, but I do know that as a historian, they, that they must have seen something. You see, when you look at all of the other evidence, she who is on the liberal end and does not, you know, say she's, she does not uh, call herself a Christian, she says, I know they saw something. In fact, what I'm reading here is that you're getting awful close to believing in a physical resurrection of Jesus. Because at this point in time, what we're seeing here, even from those who are not conservative scholars, they're saying when you look at all of the evidence, it seems that something very mysterious and very real happened to cause what we know has happened today with Christianity being the religion that it is today. And that's what we're going to walk through here right now. So let's look at the five powerful arguments that support a bodily resurrection of Jesus. And the first one, well, let me take you to our slide. It's always nice to kind of see where we're going. All right, so five powerful arguments for the resurrection. I can use the word powerful, and it's not boastful, because these are not mine, okay? These are other people. Other people have studied this subject for a very long time. I'm comprising it, summarizing it, and sharing it with all of you, and giving, you know, I guess, uh, kudos to those who have influence this study as I go along. Five powerful arguments for the resurrection. Number one, the Old Testament itself. Number two, there are real details in the resurrection account that you just like, if you were making this up, you would have not done it that way. You'd have left either those things out or not include them because 
That's just not what you would do. Number three, the Saturday Sabbath going to a Sunday. Saturday Sabbath going to a Sunday. So a Sabbath day change. Number four, Christianity's beginnings. Just how Christianity began. The, uh, the boldness of its beginnings, but also the humility of its beginnings. And then, of course, Paul and others we could throw in there. So here we go. Let's look at the Old Testament. Check this uh, passage out in Psalm 22. Reminder here, the Psalms were written well before the Roman Empire existed and well before crucifixion existed. We see here a Messianic Psalm, meaning this is a Psalm speaking about the coming Messiah. And in these verses we read, Dogs surround me, a pack of villains encircle me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. We just looked at Jesus' trial and crucifixion last week. This is certainly what would have been going on when Jesus was hanging on the cross. They divided my clothes among them and cast my lots for garment. I mean, how specific is that? And when you think about that, how specific of a messianic prophecy that is. Huge. Then we look at this classic. I'm not going to read all of it. I highlighted this is from Isaiah. Again, hundreds of years before Jesus. Isaiah says here, chapter 53, verse 5, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. It goes on to talk about more of what this Um, Messiah was going to experience check out verse 10 yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer and though the the Lord makes his life an offering for sin talk about you know there was a a professor I believe at Moody Bible College who took I think it was him or a friend did this but they took this section of scripture and they went around their office And he went around his office and he asked people, who is this describing? Without a doubt. I mean, unanimously, everyone said Jesus. And he said, you know what's crazy is this was written way before Jesus ever lived. So you would share this with the modern reader or listener, even the casual person that knows about Christianity. You share this with them. They know it's talking about Jesus, but this was written way before Jesus. So one of the best arguments for Not just who Jesus was and believing in him, but also for the resurrection is the Old Testament scriptures themselves. Because they were speaking of a time when the Messiah would suffer for the sins of the world. This was God's plan all along. What about the real details shared? Um, The real details. So... All four Gospels declare that women were the first and primary witnesses to Jesus' resurrection. And I love that. What a subtle way for Christianity to begin by turning the world right side up and showing respect to women. I mean, what a subtle but a phenomenal way of doing it. Isn't God cool how he did that? The very first people, primary witnesses to Jesus' resurrection are women who in that time period... By and large, their testimony was thrown out or not considered valid in the court of law. But God says, not in my kingdom. And so the primary witnesses for Jesus' resurrection are women. And of course, if you were making this up, is that what you would have done in the first century? We want the whole world to believe this. Who's going to be the main witnesses? Women. Doesn't make sense. Unless it was true. So what I said here is the second most powerful point, or a second powerful point to Jesus' resurrection is the fact that it gives you real details. That you're like, people wouldn't make that up. Also, when we think about the scriptures, what about Deuteronomy 21, 23? Kind of going back to the Old Testament, how it supports Jesus' resurrection, but also the crucifixion, his life, everything. Deuteronomy 21, 23 says this, You must not leave the body hanging on the pole overnight. 
Be sure to bury it that same day because anyone who is hung on a pole is under God's curse. This is God telling Israel, if you are hung up on a pole and you die, that must mean you are under God's curse. If you were Jewish followers of God's law, would you make up a story that says our Messiah that's going to save the world hung on a cross? It just doesn't jive unless it's the real deal. Unless it's just the real details and we're sharing it. And yes, this person was under God's curse, but under what type of curse? We know, we looked at the other scriptures, Jesus came to take away the curse of sin from humanity, right? So again, just the details. What about the embarrassing details we looked at, you guys, a week or two ago in a row? About how Jesus' male followers... All were like, hey, we're going to follow you, Jesus. And Peter was like, even if all people scatter, I'm going to stay committed to you, even if I have to die. And he doesn't. He denies Jesus. All of the disciples scatter. We see here that there is this lack of boldness. We see here in scriptures that there is this lack of commitment to Jesus when Jesus goes to the cross. They scatter. They're scared understandably you wouldn't put those details in if you were making up this grand legendary story about this man named jesus of nazareth who's a teacher a miracle worker and some point down the road dies the death of a cross and then rises from the dead you just wouldn't do that what about the sabbath change my man craig blumberg says this Looking at the third point, the Sabbath changing from a Saturday to a Sunday, he says something dramatic must have happened on that first Sunday to cause Christians to stop resting and worshiping on the Sabbath, Saturday, the day commanded by God from the time of the Ten Commandments onward to be set aside as holy and replace it with Sunday observance. Indeed, it is arguable that nothing short of the bodily resurrection of Jesus can adequately explain the rise of the post Easter Christian faith more generally. Why on planet earth would the Sabbath that has been going on for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years be suddenly changed from Saturday to Sunday? I mean, you got to have something absolutely catastrophic that would just alter these Jewish believers to go from worshiping and resting on a Sabbath, Saturday to Sunday. And he lays it out very well. Let's look at the fourth point. What about Christianity's unexpectedly bold, for A, and yet humble, for B, beginnings? Let me take you to a couple scriptures here. Mark, we looked at, this is uh, what I referenced just a few minutes ago. Mark says, Here Jesus is saying, you guys are all going to fall away. We see Peter says, no, even if everyone falls away, I'm going to stay committed to you. Jesus says, no, you're not. You're actually going to deny me. We see here in Mark 14, 48 through 50, Jesus says to those people coming out to take him captive, am I leading a rebellion? Jesus said, you've come out with swords and clubs, capture me. And notice here it says, but the scriptures must be fulfilled, verse 50, then everyone deserted him and fled. They were scared. They were absolutely scared. And at this point, Jesus hasn't even been uh, put through the trial yet. He hasn't been, you know, flogged. He hasn't been crucified. This is where they're at at this point in time. Check out John 20, 19 through 20. This speeds up the action a little bit. So Jesus has been crucified at this point. Says here in John 20, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for the fear of the Jewish leaders... So Jesus has been crucified. He has not appeared to the disciples at this point, or at least not maybe again at this point, depending on where we're at in the chronology of Jesus' resurrection. But we see here they are still very petrified and afraid. And it says Jesus comes to them, stands among them, and says, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed him or showed them, rather, his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. You see here, what on earth changed these 
scared and leaderless disciples, I mean, scared to death, and rightfully so. They just witnessed their leader, the Messiah, brutally murdered and hung on a tree by their own people. Jewish people said, leaders, certain leaders said, this guy is not good and he needs to die. Where did they get the boldness? Where did they get the courage? Let's go to our text this morning. This is the only section of our text in Mark 16. Mark 16, verse 6. Don't be alarmed. This is the angel speaking. This is the uh, spokesman of the, the two angels. Don't be alarmed. He said, you're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. What does it say here? He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him, but go. Tell his disciples and Peter he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Check out the response of the women. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Now, if you all did the pre-reading for today, you would have read all of Mark. And probably in your study Bible, or even if you have just a, a normal Bible like the church provides... Typically, there is at least a footnote that says after verse 8, most manuscripts here, it says the earliest, most reliable manuscripts and some other ancient witnesses don't have verses 9 through 20 in Mark. So later versions have the, the 9 through 20 added in, and so your Bible makes that note. Anytime that happens in Scripture, it's always noted, and it's very, very rare that it happens. So really... It's probably best to believe that Mark 16 ends in verse 8. And that leaves us with then what? The women being bewildered and fleeing from the tomb and not saying anything to anyone. Now, if you didn't catch my Easter Sunday service, we talked about this. The other Gospels add to this and help to make sense of how the women changed their mind. And we kind of followed that course of events from there. But... What I do want to point out here, and this is just emphasizing my overall point, the male followers and the female followers, the closest disciples of Jesus, were all afraid. What changed them? What made them become courageous and bold? The answer is a resounding Jesus rose from the dead, physically appeared to them, and that totally transformed them. Gave them a conviction and a boldness and a direction and a vision that they did not have. Check out Acts. Acts, I'm just looking at a couple of verses here. The priests, don't now remember here, Acts, what we're going to be reading, these are the same people, these are the same leaders that were overseeing Jesus' crucifixion, the Jewish leaders. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus, the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. A couple of things, just in case you're not aware. Acts is the story that immediately follows Jesus' resurrection. It was written by Luke, the same author of the Gospel of Luke. So Luke wrote Luke, the Gospel, and Acts. And Acts is the continuation of what happens after Jesus rises from the dead. So now suddenly... We see here Peter and John are speaking to the people about Jesus' resurrection. Then we see in the verses that follow, um, let me see here, the verses that follow, uh, verses 4 through 12, Peter then gives this bold speech, includes a statement that the power they received, so this, this all kind of sprung from a miracle that they did. They basically uh, helped this, this man, a crippled man, and they even mentioned this power that they got to to. To help this crippled man came from Jesus. In these verses that I mentioned, 4 through 12 of chapter 4 of Acts, they, he repeats how Jesus was crucified and was raised from the dead. Check out verse 13 of Acts. Acts 4, 13. This is the Jewish leaders. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that these guys were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. These were not prestigious men. These were not well-educated men. These were not men with, uh, you know, high positions in society. These were unschooled, ordinary men, and these guys were astonished. They're like, well, the only thing that makes these guys 
so incredible is the fact that they were with Jesus. And so we see that there's that note. And then from there, we see in verses 14 through 17, the Jewish leaders hold a private meeting. They say, what can we do? We can't deny the miracle. They helped this crippled man that they said they did in the power of Jesus. So here's their response. They called them in again, Peter and John, and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Look at the boldness of Peter and John. This does not match with the Peter and John who were locked in the room with the other disciples fearing these same guys. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Something changed in these disciples dramatically, foundationally. They were like, something has happened. And that's the evidence that even Paula Fredrickson was talking about. When you look at all of the evidence, it just adds up that they seen something. There was something that was there that was supernatural, that was a phenomenon that we can't explain. And yes, the scriptures say it was the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus. That's what's going on. All right. Part B goes along with verse 13. So let me take you back. So part B, remember I said there's this boldness that you can't explain from the early church without the resurrection of Jesus. There's also this humility that's just there. That's part 4B of the powerful arguments of the resurrection of Jesus. These are unschooled, ordinary men. When we think about this, I mean, this is an incredible thought. Let me just come down here. This is an incredible thought that a small, insignificant group of men and women who followed and loved and supported a man named Jesus totally changed the course of human history and birthed the largest religion in the world with billions of followers. I mean, think about that thought. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, this is what we're saying, that a very small group of insignificant, unschooled Men and women who loved, supported, and followed Jesus totally changed the course of human history and birthed the largest religion in the world with billions of followers. And they did that with what? Just a story? A legend that they were sharing with people? No, the reason, how, the reason that they had to go out and share what they were sharing is because they seen the resurrection, they saw Jesus rise from the dead, that makes the most logical sense. Remember, there was no government supporting or backing the early church for like 300 years. We got to remember that. The first Christians actually were persecuted and often marginalized. Talk about humble beginnings. Talk about the odds of creating the largest religion in the world if there wasn't something dramatic, significant, catastrophic, totally supernatural like a resurrection from the dead. Okay, here we go into our last one, last point. So I looked at 1, 2, 3, 4a, 4b, looking at fifth powerful argument for the resurrection of Jesus. It is the apostle Paul himself. Let me take you to the... 1 Corinthians 15. So this is the, that creed that we looked at a little bit ago. These are the following verses. For I am the least of the apostles, Paul says, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than them all, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. In Acts chapter 7, we're told that a man, Christian man, named Stephen is stoned. He's stoned for being a Christian. And leading this charge, or at least one of the leaders in this stoning, was a man named Saul. Many of you are familiar with this story. Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, read this. And Saul approved of their killing him, speaking of Stephen. That day, a severe persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, speaking of the Christian church. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout the countryside of Judea and Samaria. Devout men buried Stephen and made 
loud lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church by entering house after house, dragging both men and women. He committed them to prison. If you go on in the book of Acts, chapter 9 opens with this. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, because many early Christians were Jews, right? So that if he found any who belonged to what they called the way, men or women, speaking of the early Christian church, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And of course, on his way there, he has this experience. He meets the resurrected Jesus. And it's totally incredible when we read about it. Now, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what to do. In the following verses, he goes into the city. He can't see. He's blind. They put him in bed. And then God speaks to this man named Ananias. Not the same Ananias earlier in Acts that was not doing cool things. Different guy. So Ananias is told by God, go see Paul. You need to... And, of course, his name's Saul at this point. Go see Saul. You need to pray for him. I have work I want to do with this man. And Ananias is like, hey, God, I don't know if you know, but this guy's not a cool dude. I've heard about him. He's actually persecuting your church, just so you know, FYI. And God's like, yeah, I do know. Thanks, though. And here's what God says to Ananias. You ready? But the Lord said to him, go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Ananias listens to the Lord, prays for Paul, and literally something like scales falls from Paul's eyes. So he was temporarily blind. He can see again. Paul gets up, and if you like the King James Version, it says he takes in some meat, and he's starting to feel better. So for you vegetarians out there, vegans, take note. It says take, eat meat. I'm just kidding. I'm not hating on that at all. That was just a little joke. It's just the way the King James rendered it, right? Food, all right? So he takes some food. He's feeling better, and check out what it says right after that. After taking some food, he regains strength for several days Saul, known now, of course, later in Scripture as Paul, was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. All who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem among those invoked this name? And has he not come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests? Saul became increasingly more powerful and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Messiah. You know that in the short term, if you punch into Google, Google says that Paul wrote almost a third of the entire New Testament, 28%, just under a third. Skeptics really struggle with Paul. They really struggle to make sense. And many skeptics have converted to Christianity because they just can't see any other logical conclusion as to why a man who was devoutly Jewish, devoutly committed to persecuting the church, would totally change, I mean a 180, and begin to become a leader of the early church. Unless he had everything to lose, nothing to gain, unless he literally saw a physical resurrection of Jesus. Let's pray. God, we are very thankful for what you have done in the lives of people before us. I put on the screen a moment ago where it talked about how Paul is the fifth argument, along with others, for why we believe in the resurrection, a physical resurrection of Jesus. Because God, you have continued to work in people's lives. As Jesus said to Thomas, blessed are those who don't see but believe in me. And so God, we are so thankful for all the blessed 
people who have lived after the resurrection, who have believed in the true account of your life and death and physical resurrection and have continued to walk out their faith, passing it on to others. God, we are so thankful for the witnesses who have gone before us. And God, help us to be faithful witnesses today. Lord, I pray you'd bless our time, bless our Sunday. We're thankful for this church, the freedoms we have in this country. We do not take it for granted. God, for those watching online, please bless them as well. We thank you for today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.